Um, so, uh, my name is David Benjamin. I'm an assistant professor in the architecture program at GSAL um, and also director of the Advanced Studios. I want to welcome you to Architecture and Artificial Intelligence, the first in a series of events uh, that aims to explore how uh, the advance of artificial intelligence throughout our contemporary world uh, may impact the built environment and also vice versa. Um, of course, you, you probably already know artificial intelligence is much hyped and overused and it means many different things to many people. Many accounts of artificial intelligence uh, may start with the Turing test in 1950 and go on to chart the rise of machines uh, advancing in playing games against humans. Um, so these kind of accounts describe the epic battle in 1997 shown here between the world's best human chess player, Gary Kasparov, and the world's best computer, IBM's Deep Blue. In the first game of the match, Deep Blue made a highly unusual play, sacrificing a rook while ahead, which seemed to hint at a sophisticated strategy. Kasparov was rattled. Uh, the game ended in a draw, but Deep Blue went on to win the match. The chess world found this devastating. And, and years later, one of the inventors of Deep Blue revealed that the fateful play had been due actually to a software bug. <laughs> in the end, the computer won not because of an innovative strategy, but because the human was prone to worry and doubt and self-destruction. So Kasparov had assumed that machine intelligence worked like human intelligence, and therefore the unusual move must have been a sign of superiority, but actually the computer had a different intelligence altogether. More recently, another computer, Google's DeepMind, defeated another human, Lee Sedol, in the game Go, which was once considered a game for uniquely human intelligence. It was thought that Go was impossible for a machine to win due to the nearly infinite number of outcomes and the difficulty of calculating which player is leading at any given moment, the difficulty of creating a metric. Uh, the victory of DeepMind uh, may signal an age of computers being able to solve specifically human problems. Google's computer used big data and machine learning, and the potential of these technologies for all kinds of applications is stunning. But these techniques involve some results which, in some cases, can be troubling. As with all technologies, machine learning involves assumptions and biases, but the assumptions uh, of machine learning may be even more troubling than other assumptions because sometimes they are hidden even from their own inventors. This concept has been articulated in recent writing by people like Kathy O'Neill and Kate Crawford, uh, who have shown how the biases of these algorithms can lead to things like racial profiling and policing, sexism and job listings, and uneven distribution of resources in urban neighborhoods. And these arguments imply that understanding algorithms requires understanding the humans who create them, the humans who are also, in some cases, displaced by them, and also the humans who are affected by their conclusions. Perhaps the battles of chess and go and the growth of machine intelligence that they re represent suggest that it is important for all of us, uh, I would say as architects, but also as citizens, to become more fluent in algorithms. It's important to understand what's going on under the hood, including the bugs that these algorithms contain, the data they are based on, and the rules that lead to their conclusions. This is crucial not just to be able to use the algorithms effectively, but also to be able to guide, temper, and respond to their use. In other words, AI is a political issue as well as a technical issue. Boxcar 2D. The game which you don't actually do anything other than sit. Thank you for turning that sound up. That was not meant to. <laughs> um, oops. And it's not playing now. Um, not sure. It was playing? No, it's still working. Oh, it's just not working. Well, anyway. Um, so, to kind of wrap up here, I. 
in the context of these ideas, I think it's uh, relevant in this kind of session for us to address what does this mean for education and for architecture. Um, so one of the provocations that I've been thinking about a lot over the past couple of years um, comes from the neurologist Richard Burton, who describes a cognitive dissonance that occurs as machines become smarter and smarter. But Burton compares human intelligence to artificial intelligence and then goes on to argue that the ultimate value added of human thought will lie in our ability to contemplate the non-quantifiable. Machines cannot and will not be able to tell us the best immigration policies, whether or not to proceed with gene therapy, or whether or not gun control is in our best interest. In other words, since machines cannot worry, and since machine and uh, since machines cannot worry, and since worry and doubt are productive in creating humanistic, fair solutions to the problems of our time, humans will never be replaced by machines. But then Burton goes on to argue that in this context, what we need in education is not necessarily to get better and better at programming machines, but instead to develop the opposite, to cultivate the cognitive skills that won't be replaced by machines, to reinvest in the humanities, and to save the literary novel from extinction. So it is in this context that we've organized today's event. It's meant to be open-ended, to cover a range of work uh, going on in AI, from architecture and from other fields, uh, that may influence and even redefine our field in the coming years. Some of the questions we, we may explore include what kind of assumptions and a bias might accompany machine learning for the physical world, what specific roles and jobs in the design and construction industries might be replaced by automation, and what new forms of liter uh, literacy and criticality are necessary in architectural education and practice. We'll have three speakers today, um, and I will introduce them very briefly now up front, and they will um, then present uh, each uh, with a short presentation, followed by hopefully a good amount of time for audience questions and for uh, reflection and discussion. The first speaker is Julie Dorsey. Um, she is a Yale professor of computer science and the founder and chief scientist at Mental Canvas. Uh, Julie came to Yale in 2002 from MIT, where she held tenured appointments in both the Department of Electrical Engineering and uh, Computer Science and the School of Architecture. Her research interests include material and texture models, sketch-based modeling, and creative applications of AI. She's received several professional awards, including MIT's Egerton Faculty Achievement Award, a National Science Foundation Career Award, and an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Research Fellowship. I actually changed my mind. I think we'll introduce the, the uh, panelists one by one, and so I'd like you all to welcome Julie, and I'll introduce the other panelists. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, David, and thank you for organizing this session on such a fascinating topic. Um, uh, I am uh, a researcher and professor in the area of computer graphics. Um, just about all of my research over the years has been motivated or informed by architecture in some ways. Um, and today I wanted to talk about two topics, that of uh, material appearance design and drawing. Um, both have a very rich and interesting history. But I think they also both have very interesting features in the context of AI, and particularly with respect to architecture. So uh, the tradition of appearance model is a very old one. And one of the reasons I find this topic fascinating is that uh, both scientists and uh, artists have theorized about the, the appearance of the natural world for a very long time. And um, for example, Rembrandt and his contemporaries during the 17th century were fascinated by the problem of creating realistic flesh tones. And so they kind of developed these models in which they put various layers of lacquers and paints and pigments on a canvas. And using that kind of set of layers, they could build up and mimic what real skin looks like. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, scientists have also been fascinated with appearance. For example, uh, the 19th century classical physicist Lord Rayleigh was really interested in things like 
why is the sky blue, uh, why do butterflies, uh, feathers and bird feathers look the way they do it, why do butterflies have this kind of iridescent pattern, what causes that? And also other questions about um, appearance of different kinds of scales, but all from a kind of physical uh, standpoint. Today we use these kinds of insights, I think both from artistic and design disciplines, as well as uh, physically, physics and uh, related disciplines to develop uh, computer models that can be used to make very, very realistic and accurate models of materials. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit about what goes into a material model. And I want to get to the idea of what, how, what role can artificial intelligence play in helping to describe material appearance today. So a material model, when we look at a material, it's really composed of three parts. There's a spectral component of the color. There's a kind of directional component, which is whether it's shiny or matte or glossy. And then spatial variations, or high resolution texture. Now if this is, um, gives you an idea of what it might look like um, on a real object, on the left we just have a perfectly kind of diffuse or matte surface, and then we've added in a spectral component, and then a directional component, and then finally you can see a spatial component where the texture is buried across the surface. Now, unfortunately today, in most computer systems, this is kind of what you're looking at in terms of developing material design. Um, uh, this is an example from Maya, but it could, we could look at also something like Rhino. Um, what you see here is a, a huge array of parameters. Um, uh, many of those parameters, it's not just the sheer number of things that you're tuning, but also there's this idea that many of these parameters don't actually have any sort of physical basis. They're just kind of made up, they're like hacks. And that's actually how we specify materials often when we're trying to design something new. You can also, of course, bring in things from off the shelf, but I'm really intrigued with the problem of how can we actually design new appearances. So we've done a lot of work, um, my students and I, in things like texture modeling, um, material modeling of various kinds. Uh, this is one example of kind of bringing in real world examples, learning about them, and starting to integrate them into simulations and eventually maybe into new buildings. Um, so for example, we could take this exemplar that you see in the upper left and you know when we look at that, we sort of want the most dominant texture there, but instead of we just sort of grab it and synthesize it, we end up with this kind of odd looking frog instead of the one that we want on the bottom. So how can we kind of recognize from images the most salient features. We've done lots of work from exemplars. For example, in the upper left, you can see some terrazzo, where we can take from a single picture, actually synthesize the statistics of that into a volume of material that you see there. Um, we can also do things like taking arrays of images, we can obtain an array, array of exemplars, all kind of being pushed by the end user. Here's an example um, in the upper right. You can see uh, we're actually doing some large scale editing from a single picture and now fine scale editing. So we're able to kind of recognize a variety of different kinds of scale of texture in images automatically such that we can integrate them into a variety of kinds of applications. So kind of moving away from the Rhino or, or Maya uh, specification of materials, I'm also interested in developing new fundamental models that will you know, sort of sustain a range of appearances over time. Um, and if you've been to Venice, you know that uh, the kind of really pristine sort of images that you generate, computers just don't kind of cut it. So this is a long-term uh, project to um, kind of develop both new underlying models here, in this case we're using layers, uh, but also to look at the problem of kind of programming the surface, if you will, over time. So here we have a variety of different kinds of uh, surface changes that are happening over time. And we can sort of say we're going to polish the surface with one operator, tarnish the surface, and so on. So we have all of this kind of high-level control, but in a way that's very intuitive 
and automatically is attached to certain parts of the surface. Um, we've done other things with surface patterning, using simulations, um, doing a patterning that involves the changes to both shape and appearance. And we've also done a lot of work in things like capturing uh, uh, the way that appearance is automatically attached to shape, learning that, and then being able to synthesize it on brand new shapes. So on the left you see the capture in the lab, and then in the right here you can see examples of where we've taken that detailed appearance over time and then applied it automatically uh, to new materials. But I think um, in terms of this idea of exemplars, there are lots of additional interesting things that you can do. Um, more recently we've looked at things like we sort of revisited our work in generating flow patterns and said, well, let's say we have some exemplars. These are real things that you might see outside this building. We can kind of now analyze those patterns, extract parameters from them, put them into a simulation model, and then be able to generate these kinds of effects attached to geometry and adapted to geometry automatically uh, based on an underlying model. Here you can see some examples. We've also done some work uh, recently on what I call tactile mesh saliency. Uh, wearable objects look more in the buildings, let's say. Uh, how will material vary with use? Uh, where will people touch shapes? How do you collect all this data? We've come up with, we did a bunch of user studies and built a model and kind of using uh, deep learning to estimate or rank different parts of a surface and we can kind of predict what will happen to a shape, uh, where its weak points might be, for example. Um, and we've also continued to build out kind of full systems from physical materials to physical realizations. And just show you this is an example of a piece of velvet. Um, we're doing a lot of work looking at materials at different scales. And here you can see something like a velvet pillow. And if we zoom in, we start get looking at some of the underlying structure. And we've been building interfaces so that you can actually kind of edit things at multiple scales at the same time instead of tuning sliders in Maya with the idea that you can have a lot of control both over the underlying structure of the material as well as the final look. And this is kind of a forward approach where you start out with, let's say, some material and some texture, and then you end up with a final look that you see here. But even more interesting, I think, is backwards, where you kind of start out with um, something, a given appearance. Maybe you find something out in the real world or a set of materials, and you'd like to kind of work backwards to being able to create something like that yourself. Um, so here's an example of doing a detailed analysis where we can actually come up with what the reflectance and texture should be. And more recently we've done some work with cloth models, very, very detailed textiles. Um, and again, using some data-driven models connected to procedural models where we can extract parameters, we can begin to do things like this. We're very, uh, very, very detailed editing of a very complicated appearance with uh, detailed structure. So there, these are just kind of first steps. I think this is a fascinating area, and I think really the interfaces of the future for both creating materials and designing materials will largely be, I think, driven to some degree by AI, and I think it's really up to architects and designers to decide what are the right handles. Uh, but more important, I think the power of AI in this particular area is really kind of helping you achieve a particular appearance that might be interesting. But not just about things that exist already in the real world, but I think there's potential today with all the advances in fabrication to actually connect uh, by an entirely new appearance that we've never thought of or dreamed of before with the ability to actually fabricate or create it. Next, I'm going to talk just briefly about some work in drawing. Again, a uh, long, his rich history. But this is what drawing a drawing looks like to us today. 
And I want to talk a little bit about what drawing could be in the future. So drawing, um, even with uh, the state of CAD and fabrication today, is fundamental to creativity and communication. It's been used from, you know, by Leonardo um, to develop movie storyboards, the movies um, from Disney on up to the present, uh, Gary's conceptual sketches, product designs, and so on. But what's really fascinating about drawing is that drawing on a computer today is not so different than drawing was on paper during the Renaissance. Um, music, photography, and text have been completely revolutionized by computation. But drawing is really largely the same. So one of the things I'm very interested in is looking at the space that sits between 2D sketching and 3D modeling. So 2D sketching is expressive, fluid, but it contains static views. Whereas 3D modeling is very rigid, cumbersome, time consuming to create, but offers dynamic viewing. And I'm fascinated by what can happen in the space between them. Uh, my office is right near Erosamian's um, hockey arena at Yale, also known as the Whale. Um, and these, this kind of form is very interesting to me. How can we develop kind of drawing systems that might allow you to explore a form like that without locking into uh, a very detailed geometric representation? These are examples of Henry Moore's idea sketches. Again, very free-flowing. Um, he has talked about uh, sculptures falling out of such sketches. Um, he, Louis Kahn uh, sketches at varieties of different kinds of scales. So um, my vision is to enhance visual communication with a computer by elevating the way people draw, adding brand new capabilities. I'm just going to skip ahead um, show you a couple of examples. Um, this is a new type of drawing, a drawing, um, you probably recognize it, Grand Central Station, but one that you can actually move through, and it has all this animation kind of built in for free. Uh, this is just to give you a flavor of how this kind of authoring system works. You can draw just like you might on a piece of paper. You can pick features in the drawing, and then kind of add another drawing that uh, sort of hangs off of that original drawing. So it's like you're drawing on transparent canvases in space. And then add another sheet in the foreground. very quickly without necessarily knowing where you're going to go a priori. And you can also have a number of different drawings uh, that may or may not uh, go together in the system at once. Um, the idea of the system, sort of idea behind it, is really that, uh, that coherence is developed gradually. So these are some, I've uh, just added some water to the scene, but you can see it's on the wrong canvas. So one of the things you can do here is you can select your strokes and now place a hinge in the drawing that is select a feature. And using the bird's eye view in the upper right, you can actually reproject those strokes. They're not being translated, they're actually being reprojected. And now you can see they're in the right place. So you can actually draw things and then kind of reinterpret your strokes as you go. 
So um, we've also done work along these lines with in situ design, that is placing drawings into real sites where we can make a very abstract model of a scene very quickly from photographs, elevation data, and site plan. And then you can create drawings like this in situ. Now one of the things we're working on right now is um, how can we do better than this? Um, right now, there's very little when you draw in a, uh, a digital drawing system. There's really no semantic information. So we've begun to do some work in not turning sketches or drawings into shapes, but actually learning from a large-scale user study the kinds of strokes that people draw. For example, silhouette strokes that indicate uh, the boundaries of a surface, hatching strokes, which give us shading, and stipple strokes, which give us silhouettes from the light source. We're going to analyze these things and be able to recognize them, such that you can create a kind of drawing that is very, that's 3D, but also very malleable. Um, and it's strokes that support an imagined shape without going to that actual uh, final shape. So I'm going to conclude there. Um, and uh, brings David back up. Moving right along is Natasha Luther, Director of Learning Technologies at Jacobs and the 2018 Chair of the AIA Technology and Architecture Practice Committee. Um, Natasha is the BBC Director of Emerging Technologies at the Platform Technology Group Jacobs, which you probably know of and you know their work. Um, and um, she was also um, part of this AIA uh, community. Um, including a, a knowledge community focused on the intersection of technology in architecture. In this capacity, she hosted the 2018 Building Connections Congress in Washington, D.C., a conference that, that looked at the themes of the future of design in the age of AI and machine learning. So remember, this is the AIA. Um, even the kind of traditional AIA is very interested in, in AI and looking at what kind of that kind of thing looks. We'll hear more about um, And finally, um, while Natasha trained as an architect, uh, she has found that her true impetus is to be the tip of the spear as it, as it is related to technology and design. And I think that's probably a statement that resonates with many of our students at the school. So uh, thank you for being here, Natasha. When I got invited to this thing, I did exactly what I typically do, which is panic. <laughs> um, while I am personally really interested in uh, in themes of, of technology and in design and architecture practice, I don't think the industry is quite there yet. Um, AI as well, and, you know, and I don't have this in my presentation, but we'll talk about it later. But during my Building Connections Congress, uh, which is about 100 people showing up and, and talking about uh, various themes, I think it's more of a, there's always this sort of sense of fear before excitement, and, and that's an interesting concept of when we think about technology and what it means for us. Um, but similarly, you know, we've been talking about this within the industry, within the way we work, and what we do on a, on a regular basis, and, and there are a few studies that show that within the next 10 years, and, and Jacobs is primarily an engineering company, but there's a, there's a study that says four out of the 10 big in, uh, engineering companies in the next 10 years will be disrupted. Um, which makes us wonder which, which side do we want to be on. <laughs> so when we started thinking about that, um, we decided uh, that we needed to be able to manage what we call an innovation portfolio. We need to be able to drive the idea of technology and how we think about innovation within what we do on a regular basis. Uh, we were thinking about a technology, uh, an innovation portfolio that focuses on the near, medium, far, and transformation. I sit in the building's um, infrastructure and advanced facilities from Jacobs, which is only 33,000 people strong, <laughs> which is uh, a little bit of a challenge when you think about how do you try and drive innovation in such a big company, and how do you bring that innovation to the fore? How do you think about themes like we're talking about right now um, on such a large scale? We've been doing all sorts of studies um, really on sort of what we call part-time passion technology projects where you 
the AR, VR, you know, mental reality settings when we've been looking at additive construction and, and working with NASA to do that. But those are all sort of part-time studies that we do and when we have billable work and when we have proposals, all of this sort of has to wait. Um, so we started thinking about how we need to do it. We thought that we need to see the change. We need to change how we thought about it. So for the first time in the history of our company, we had a, a CTIO, uh, this uh, Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at corporate level that has never existed in our history before. Um, and from there down, we started thinking about ways we would have to, to focus on what we needed to do. So this is my job right now. I run um, an, an incubator program and an emerging, in, uh, emerging ideas program within the company. The incubator program is not quite like you would expect uh, as a typical sort of a technology accelerator program. The incubator program is sort of very internally focused. When you have 33,000 people to begin with, you can probably find enough people to have a conversation uh, around technologies uh, within your, your organization. So my, my first workshop, um, I had about 12 people, and I had everybody from a blockchain expert who happens to be a civil engineer, um, to people who were talking about urban planning and um, essentially anything you can think of, interior designers, people like that. Um, the, and the incubator program is really looking at these transformational ideas. It is looking at, we identified about nine separate themes that we thought we needed to focus on. And from those, we are currently sort of working our way down to about four or five ideas. We think that we'd be able to come down to maybe one or two ideas that truly are what could potentially transform who we are um, as a company. I can't talk about them, but <laughs> they're, they're interesting to say the least. Um, on the other hand, the Emerging Ideas program is the, is the other part of the program that I run. And that program, um, when I say emerging, I truly mean ideas emerging from the practice. These are people who are working on projects with clients every single day and, and sort of coming up with these ideas saying, if I could just do this, if I could just take data and I could use this in three different ways, I could potentially do something with that. So the idea is, can we take those ideas, lift them out of a, a client situation or a project situation, fund that a little bit, and see where we can take that. So we've been doing different ideas from there. Um, but really, the goal of that program, essentially, is to teach us how to think about ideas. Right? We're all incredibly creative people in, in everything that we do. We, coming up with ideas is the easy part. What you do with those ideas when you have them is, mother, is the much, much harder task that we're trying to figure out, which is how do you take through an idea and in an industry situation, how do you build a business case around it, or how do you describe how this is going to change what we do? So the program that we're building off of them, and we're actually working a little bit off the, the Adobe Kickbox idea, which if you're familiar with is, it helps you structure the idea in a way that you can proceed from it. So if you know, sort of this, big uh, flash that you have and work through it. Um, what we do is we think of it in three different steps, so generating, validating, and implementing. Uh, the generation is, is the different ways we're doing it. The validating is how do you validate this is a good idea. Um, I've built within the company what I call a disciplined brain trust. So I send this out to 40, 50 people, say, what do you think? Does this make sense? Can we proceed with this? Do you think this needs to be funded? Um, how much, if you will, um, and things like that. And then we take it into what it is, for us, in some ways, that would be the hardest thing is the implementation idea. So how do you start implementing this on more than one project, or that one marketing project that we talked about, um, that we can use it at? And then this is the other really, really hard part of what we do. The idea would be that we need to be comfortable with the idea of failure. We need to be able to say that it's okay if this idea doesn't work out. We, we invested a little bit of time and money in it, but um, you know, this isn't the direction we need to go, and this isn't quite working out. Um, so how do you think it through that? Um, this is also really, really hard for us, right? This is also really hard for us, um, because we are all, you know, when you come into a company, into an industry, you're, you're expected that you will be successful at every step that you go. Um, so for us to make that cultural change between that has been um, an interesting way for us to, to proceed. So we are, we are trying to build a culture of innovators, not just innovation. So people who can think, who can dream big, who can take an idea, structure it all the way through uh, to a place where we could actually implement it on our projects and not be afraid of failure. 
So we start typically with a small seed investment. We ask for a proof of concept, some sort of minimum, you know, deliverable of some sort, and then we take it from there. And then if the idea really does strike an impetus, if, if it, it really focuses on and you know themes of AI are, are big there, um, or at least taking the idea of data and switching it to knowledge and talent and what that means for us. Um, other than pure data, what does it mean in technology, in a, in a knowledge perspective? Um, we take it into what we are currently planning. We hope to take it into what we are currently planning. Um, we are planning five innovation centers across the world. Um, I should have mentioned, we have, while I sit in our buildings business, we have a parallel line of business, which is aerospace and technology, our in-depth line of business, which is incredible, uh, incredibly focused around the idea of cybersecurity, IoT, and predictive analytics. So we're trying to merge those sort of technologies and the expertise that we have in both lines of business and find ways that we can work together. So these five separate innovation centers will focus on these five themes and the, the incubator and the emerging ideas program trying to feed into these ideas that we could work on. So while this is all really exciting, I want you to take a few seconds to show you things that are not quite as exciting, but hopefully getting us there. These are actual projects that we're working on. Um, so when we speak and when we think about AI, yeah, and hopefully in our discussion, I'm, I'm sure we'll bring this up, but for us, it's the idea of data and moving that into knowledge. And when we think about that, we think about how we want to acquire that data or generate that data, how we're going to evaluate that data and then take it into implementation. And so these are some of the ways we are thinking of acquiring that data. This is a project that we're doing for Transport for London. Um, and we use mobility data, so we capture 400 or million uh, mobile uh, points across the, the city of London to try and track how people are traveling through the city uh, to be able to help transport of London with their congestion plan. And then we sort of, when we're doing the evaluation of that data, um, the simulation, of course, is, is fairly expected. Um, this is the other program, project that we're working on, which is the Port of San Francisco Seawall project. So we're trying to build a seawall around um, in sort of this coast area. And uh, we've been trying to do resiliency simulations across that. So how do you, does this work? Will this work in, in, in various different events? Um, so that's still at the simulation level, but we're hoping that we can take that into a more um, AI sort of level where we can start thinking about how this could potentially work. Um, yeah, I guess just one quick thought is you have two really big levers. One is a 33,000 person yes. group, and now it's the AIA. Yes. It's a bigger organizing force, and so it's really exciting to work on that. Um, the final speaker of the afternoon before we go on to the discussion is Dewey Osinga, Principal Engineer at Sidewalk Labs. Before working for Sidewalk as the tech lead on generative urban design, Dewey Osinga founded Triposo, a mobile travel guide in Berlin, a public financing method. Uh, before that, he worked for Google in Switzerland, India, and Australia. And he is the author of the well-known book, Deep Learning Cookbook. It's a great pleasure to be here. Welcome you here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here. I hope I can uh, follow up on the other uh, presentations just now. Uh, where's this uh, flipper thingy? Uh, yeah. Um, I want to talk about five things in 15 minutes, so that's uh, going to be, uh, you know, we have to tempo a little bit. Um, I'm from Sidewalk Labs. We uh, were working to, you know, explore what the city of the future could be like, and one of the ways that we do this is using uh, urban generative design. Um, we'll start with uh, the underlying problem that we're trying to we're trying to build a district, or let alone a city. You have all these interlocking systems that you're all trying to develop at the same time, and they all have their own requirements, and a lot of them. They're simulation based, and simulation currently is a, it's, it's expensive, it's slow, and it makes for a situation where you have all these systems that talk to each other, and it, it creates all this latency where if somebody changes something in how you do with buildings, that actually trickles into obviously the cost of structure, but also how do the traffic systems around this thing work. And typically what you get is that these people then get together four weeks later and they have to redone their simulations, but all the 
the base assumptions have changed already, and it just all goes each and every way, and it makes it just hard to to get to a shared goal set of goals that you can even if you get to the shared goals, how do you how do you make sure that you're collectively going to that to those things? And that's sort of the the problem space that we're we're trying to work through. How do we put this all together? Oops. Do I point this at something else? <laughs> All right. I was going to say, it might not surprise you, that our answer is standard design. <laughs> the name of our team, but I think I kind of gave the answer away by randomly clicking through the slide deck. <laughs> Right, so what we do is um, we start with a bunch of inputs and they, they vary from the existing conditions like what does the site look like, what's the sort of climate that we have, maybe we throw in some future climate scenarios too, because you know, climate change. And then we have a bunch of things that we, we, we play with, like the type of street grid that we want to apply to this, the type of buildings, how much green space that we want to allocate, how does it work with the transit. And so we have this, this nice big space input space that we then use to generate thousands if not millions of different potential designs that we then can sort of explore by, by going through this huge n-dimensional space where every, every dot represents a solution to this. And then we, this is where the simulations come in. So of each of these things we, we have these basic objective functions. We try to combine them into something that is more interesting than just an objective function that, that tells you something about the quality of life. And then we run this simulation and we generate all these options and, and we create this situation where you can actually explore these results. So this is um, our, um, our, our, our play, playground city, it doesn't actually exist, it's called Tepetisville. And uh, it, it allows you to, to go through all these different things. You can switch on layers. You can see what the, what, what the street grid is, what the massing is like. And you can sort of look at what, what the performance of this is. And it, you know, it, 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 it gets you somewhere. <coughs> so the next thing, and this is where um, I'll promise artificial intelligence will make a, a first appearance, is um, what do you do with this? How do you how do you optimize this? Because ultimately, you know, <laughs> you want to get this the manual out of this process. You want to focus on the important thing. And, you know, where the toilet goes, maybe, could be. So what, uh, what, what, what we do is we have all these, these outcomes and you can uh, squeeze through them. And, uh, but look, what we're really after is not having, and this goes to the discussion that we'll hopefully have, we're not aiming for the computer to tell you, well, this is the answer, go build it. We want to get an idea of what the trade-off is. What is, what is the <laughs> shape of the solution space here? And one of the important things there is this, 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 this trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Right, do you want to immediately go for the hill climbing? Do you want to find the optimal solution? Or do you want to explore the entire space? And so one technique that uh, is uh, useful there is this, this, this concept of Bayesian optimization that I wanted to quickly run through. Um, essentially, in, in this case, we're, we're just simplifying things dramatically. And we're just assuming that uh, the, the shape of our space is, uh, well, effectively one dimensional. It's just this blue line. And we've, you know, we've run two experiments, and so all we know are the two red dots there. And, you know, if, if, if we only wanted to optimize, we could go like, well, maybe the left one looks better than the right one, let's explore around the left one. But if you run the Bayesian optimization, it will tell you two things. It will tell you what, what you know and where you expect scores to be higher, but it also tells you where there are interesting things to explore. So in this case, Actually, if you look at this, the most uncertainty and the highest yield of knowledge and, and, and score is to the left side. And so if we, if we do another observation there, suddenly the entire certainty 
building explodes. And now, now the model realizes that really we should, uh, we should explore more in the middle. And so when it does that, it sort of water balloons into the shape of what we want to do. And this, this process allows you to continuously make this trade-off between finding the highest scoring solution versus exploring where there is stuff that you don't know. The known and the unknowns and all that. And you keep doing that, and at some point you actually do end up with a, uh, a nice, uh, you know, you, you start sketching out this line and you discover where, where everything is. And, you know, in, in this case, you still have some uncertainty on the, on the right, which is not actually going to uh, bring us very much. Uh, right. Um, moving on to slightly more experimental, um, also machine learning. So, General adversarial networks, they were all the rage a year or so ago in, um, in the machine learning land. And so um, we decided to uh, take them for a spin and see if we could do something with um, putting walls inside of apartments. And so what we did is, um, look at that. Uh, we, we, we got our hands on a whole bunch of uh, apartment layouts and uh, <coughs> wrote this algorithm, which is not really machine learning, that removed all the internal walls. And so um, then the idea is that you train a generator that proposes a where to put the walls. And you have this other algorithm, the discriminator, that gets the fake apartment layout and the real apartment layout. And it has to guess which one is real. And in the beginning, both of these algorithms are, are very good, but it's this, you know, this competition between the two that allows them to get better. And so over time, the generator starts generating things that are very hard to distinguish, while the discriminator becomes better and better at distinguishing, and they both get better. And so this is uh, one, one, one example of that. So you have the input, which is just basically the outer walls, and we have what it actually should be. Uh, this, this place seems a little too bright for this picture. But one thing that I find fascinating, the is a little uh, worked out, but one thing that I find fascinating is that it, our stripper actually removed the windows here. And the algorithm sort of put these double lines indicating that there's windows here, back where the windows are supposed to be. So it actually recovers even the, the details that we inadvertently stripped out. It does have a certain tendency to put, you know, staircases everywhere because it does see that a lot. It has no idea what your floor is, of course. And so, similarly, if you give it something that has all the the furniture furniture inside, you know, it has no about idea about the furniture. It just, you know, puts the staircase back. <laughs> um, so. So more examples, and uh, basically, you know, when, when, when you do this, you get this machine that will just uh, randomly draw all these possible um, floor plans. All right. Um, try the same with, uh, and this is sort of interesting with uh, Google Maps. So with Google Maps, you can, uh, they have this custom view mode where you can hide certain details. And so that's kind of nice for this sort of approach because you can take a, um, a tile and then say, tell Google Maps to render the same tile with buildings or without buildings, which we can then feed into this, this, this GAN. And the GAN now has to guess where the buildings go. And over time, it actually develops a notion of where the, the buildings go. And these are actually you know, not too bad. One of the dead giveaways here is that this area doesn't have any buildings. But since the GAN was trained to put buildings, it will generally always put buildings. So, uh, final example. Um, this is another thing that uh, is, is one of those machine learning things that are fairly popular because the visual effects are really good. The basic thing is that you have a image of a certain style, and you have a target image, like the Golden Gate Bridge, and the style transfer algorithm is capable of redrawing that image in the style of the, of the style source image. And so sometimes that works really well. Then Go is always a very nice uh, way of going in because it's first very expressive style. If you take Escher, it's, uh, it's less clear that, it's, uh, that it would work. And so one, one, one thing that we were thinking is, 
Can you apply this to to cities? The street networks of cities, can you capture them as a form of style? That would be a um, bad setup if it wasn't the answer. Yes. <laughs> so, um, hmm. again, this does not render quite as nicely on my screen, but you can sort of see that, uh, you know, for, for, for Amsterdam, you get like these sort of these fluid around these lines and lots of water features thrown in. <laughs> While for New York, uh, you get sort of like the basic grit that you expect, sort of even in the orientation that you expect, and then sometimes it throws in a little Morton Park like thingy. Um, and, and it has some, some Broadway type of lines that cross the, 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 the sort of thing. And then for finally, for, for Istanbul, the, the, the downtown is very medieval, crooked streets that sometimes don't go anywhere, and it has sort of this weird, weird nice, nice structure that it captures. One thing that is sort of unexplained here is where the different, different gray bits come from. We don't know. All right. Um, how are we for time? Two and a half minutes. We can do this. All right. So this uh, this goes somewhat towards uh, one of the questions that I think is really interesting around uh, machine learning and uh, optimization. This trade-off between coming up with something original and optimization that always leads to the same thing. So this is part of our generator that proposes where to put parts. And it does, it does quite a reasonable job. It, 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 you know, sometimes it puts a big park in the middle, sometimes it puts parts on the side, sometimes it puts little scattered plots of green everywhere. But the problem is that if you make a little change in the input of the algorithm, it's not really predictable what will happen. The parks might just dramatically change. And that means that if you're, if you're going to do one of those hill climbing things, you think that you might be going in the right direction, but since this, these parks just completely change, you can't really optimize. And that's sort of frustrating. Um, the other thing is this observation from uh, Paul has that if you optimize everything, you end up with one solution, and everything looks the same, which is not optimal. So there's a there's a there's a paradox there. And so one thing that we should be uh, playing with, you might recognize this image, um, is to um, move away from the notion of optimization and more go towards growing and mutating and, and, and making this more like you know be more inspired by biology than economics, I guess. And so. An experiment that we, we ran is where we took an existing uh, design for a, uh, a, a parcel in, in Rondo that we're uh, working with. And we ran this mutator over it, which basically just takes the buildings and just randomly changes them a little bit. It might add a floor, it might delete a floor, it might expand the building, it might move the building around a little bit. And it just, you know, it just creates all these different variations. And then you run the same objective functions over it. And you get a much more diverse outcomes that have actually improvements over the original plan, but they don't all look the same. So you can see that you know, the top two have you know, nice improvements. The bottom one is way more dramatic and comes up with these super tall buildings that probably you really wouldn't do. But it, it, it gives you this much more creative and interesting solution. That's what you So I think this was a fittingly diverse um, group of, of presentations to you know, get us started on what I hope will be a longer term conversation at the school um, about some of these topics. Um, so I have, I have a number of questions and I could probably keep them for quite a while, but I want all of the audience members to know that um, I will restrain myself and soon and we'll return to ask questions to get your questions prepared. Um, I guess one of the first things that I want to specifically is, is education and specifically architectural education. So um, one way to kind of frame a, I think a very complex um, question is to put it like really simply, um, what in, in this context, this world that you can kind of apply to, um, what should we be training architecture students to do? Um, should 
should we be training them in math? Should we be training them in statistics? Um, should we be training them in coding? Um, and or should we be training them in those kind of um, qualitative, exploration-based um, ideas of human cognition and synthesis that are more in line with the humanities and the literary novel. So I don't know if you, um, none of you is necessarily exactly thinking about training argument and do a little how closest. Um, but, you know, at, in, a, in, a, in an educational institution. But I wonder, like, I mean, given all of the work you've shown, I think you, you probably all have some thoughts about that. So, in, 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 <laughs> um, I mean, so I, I think, you know, the first thing, first of all, I think it's, 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 it's still really quite early in development. If you look at the deep learning, you know, new tricks come out of it all the time. And keeping an eye on what might be applicable and what, what might not be seems like, seems useful. But I, I expect that over time, a lot of these things will just be <laughs> And you know, math is probably overrated if you're uh, if, if if you're not, uh, not 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 going with that. So like the, I mean, other other fields have against this, but there's like a, an abstraction hierarchy. There are different people at different levels that can get granular with the code, or just be plugging in modules that are controllable. So I think that's part of the conversation. I mean, I can speak from just being an advocate doing what I do, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that it, just from being out there, I don't necessarily, I think it's the latter, I think it's the humanities, I think it's the, the ability to be adaptable. Um, you know, I've, been, I've been working with this company for 10 years and I haven't done the same job two years in a row, I'd say. Um, and, and that's been a good thing. But that, the, the math and coding, I'm not quite sure, is, is quite where we have to go right now. Um, but the ability to think Naturally, is what we really need. So we have a, a somewhat new major at Yale called Computing in the Arts, uh, which requires students to take half of their major courses in computer science and half in one branch of the arts, art history, architecture, theater studies, what have you. Um, and I think many so-called digital arts programs say, you know, you just take a bunch of digital courses. And the idea here is that you would get an in-depth study of the humanities and the arts, while at the same time getting an in-depth exposure to computer science. And I think in the future, uh, the best and most interesting tools that will actually further the field of architecture are going to be made by people who have an in-depth, they must have an in-depth exposure to both. Otherwise, you end up with kind of more of the kind of Maya-esque sort of interfaces that I showed. But I think what does an architecture student need to do, need to know today? So in some of the models that you showed, um, one of the things I was thinking about is they all have uh, sort of strengths and limitations. And if you know something about the underlying models um, and what's out there, you can actually be critical about the answers you're getting. Because if you're sitting there sort of uh, navigating some curve and optimizing over some set of uh, characteristics and whatnot, you really need to be critical about the answer. Like, is this the right answer? Maybe it's not. Um, so I think, like, the architect cannot wrestle, like, cannot give up control, I think. Um, so in order to do that, you must have some a knowledge of what actually you're looking at. What are the underlying models? I don't necessarily think that architects need to be able to program those models, but they do need the controls. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I think it also really makes a different kind of approach at, at this school to all kinds of problems, including computation-related problems. Um, I think, you know, if anything, Colin B.G. South is known for um, having a critical approach to design in general that would so computation. Um, I want to drill down for a second on, on another, on, on the topic of machine learning, since that's, you know, I mean, like, Artificial intelligence is an overused term, probably. It's got such a buzz now. 
Um, but I think when we say machine learning, it gets a little more focused than when we say artificial intelligence. And I wanted to try out on, on the three of you a hypothesis that I have been developing about machine learning that I think is very relevant to its use in architecture and design. And my hypothesis is something like um, machine learning, of course, requires data. I mean, that's the, the main point of it, right? Data equals past results. Um, if we're interested in innovation, discovery, the kind of exploration that, that you described, <coughs> um, is there some incompatibility there? Because although we think at first glance, oh, maybe machine learning can help us discover something really important that I didn't already know that was already there, but we just can't see it with our human cognition, that the algorithm can detect this pattern. Um, that's really appealing, you know, for the kind of creative designer who wants to explore a new design space. But at the same time, I, I think maybe there's a flaw there because, you know, in the floor plan example, all the algorithm is doing, you know, it's only as good as what you tell that you want to do. And it's all it's doing is trying to interpret like past floor plans. So it's going to basically, it, it's a version of the problem that. Um, you know, some critics of AI and machine learning have applied to society more generally. If you require a judge sentencing people who are convicted to use past data, then you're going to perpetuate some stereotypes, you know, based on past results and flaws in the data. If we're going to require that a, you know, designer make designs based on flat, past floor plans, we're never going to get I don't know what we'd say is like the best architectural innovations, but you know the open plan, Buckminster Fuller's dome over Manhattan. That's not a machine learning, you know, machine learning technique could never come up with that. So I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about this? Both the the potential promise of machine learning for design, but also this kind of version that I'm painting where it could be valuable for some things, like an efficiency approach, but actually this promise of like discovering something great in the data. Might be overrated. So many thoughts. <laughs> um, so I, I think you make, you make a fair point, especially uh, around simple things like you know style transfer or uh, or, or these sort of sort of scams. I, I think uh, everybody's favorite counterexample would be AlphaGo, right? Where the machine actually does come up with creative strategies that humans have never thought of or have thought of but rejected as being impossible. So. And, and, and I, I, again, that's a very restricted uh, the, the game space, literally. And so maybe that's that's, uh, that's uh, to be to be it, you know expected earlier. One one thing that I uh, personally find really fascinating in this sort of thing are embedding spaces, so where every point represents a solution. And if you can get to a solution to a system where machine learning helps you project existing examples in that space, but it's capable of showing you what's in the other points that you haven't visited. There is actually this, this possibility to, to discover something. I mean, the very simple thing is, like, think that we look at, uh, you know, how, how the streets in cities, how, 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 how do they behave, what is, what is the layout? And if you have an algorithm that can reproduce things work in Paris, but also one in Manhattan, what happens if you look at 80% Manhattan and 20% or you know, you throw in a little bit of answer that, and then you have this. So, and, and again, that's sort of what I was trying to hint at in my presentation. That to, to me, like, if you can create these spaces and sort of open them up using machine learning, now you have something to explore that isn't necessarily only the observations that, that you've seen. And it's the, you showed the adversary learning networks, which ones that are fighting, not fighting each other, but are. are Comparing to each other, and think about that as sort of a human machine combination as well, and, and I think that's what you're doing. But I think that that makes sense. So a partnership is in one way or the other would is where I see that we see most happen. Yeah, and I agree. There are possibilities, particularly in things like strategy games, where you can actually develop some novel concepts as you go. Um, 
But I really very much like this idea, like for example, um, there was a recent paper about uh, designing fonts where uh, the system generates this manifold and you can kind of move around on this like abstract mathematical construct. But to your right, what you're seeing is uh, a letter being varied in a very complicated way that you might not ever think of doing. Um, so I think, I think the, the, one of the things that's really interesting here is the interfaces because I think the, the opportunity for invention will really not necessarily be seen by the algorithm but by the end user. You might just, like you can see things in this font generator that, you know, again, you would maybe generate tons and tons of versions and just not see the com complex combination of parameters as possible. Yeah, and, and that was really powerful in your work where you see the, the human interacting with this complex data-driven system at multiple scales and, and having new insights because of the way to see impact. So I, can, I haven't seen the paper you're talking about, but I can totally imagine working on the math side and then seeing the font develop. And there's this new hybrid that you're describing of the human developing a new tool, a new lever to discover something new. Along those lines, one thing that uh, we found in, in my studio um, using some of the same generative design um, systems that we have got to do and um, looking at data points which each represent a possible design solution. Um, just somewhat um, by chance, we switched from using a version of just plotting points two dimensionally. Um, one by one, so you would see like data points and then dimensional space plotted on two example axes and then two other axes. We started using an online tool to do that, and the online tool had a feature that we decided to use. The ability to see the, the, the points morph between one graph and the other graph. And we thought, this is really cool, but why is it cool? It's cool because the human mind can detect things in that representation that you wouldn't see if you just saw two static graphs. By seeing the points move, say, from their input space visualization to their output space visualization, and if they're color-coded color in a certain way, we started to see these patterns that were totally just quantitative, driven by the data, but also taking advantage of human probably neuroscience, right? Something about our brain's ability to detect movement. So it's not only color, it's right. movement. And I think we probably know that because like the human mind is trained to see a tiger coming in our peripheral vision. So there's something about this, this new thing that developed and we're trying to investigate that more, but you know how the human pattern recognition is really interesting as well as the machine pattern recognition combining them and having interfaces. I totally think that's, that's a great word for it. Um, let's see. I want to make sure we have time for questions from the audience. Are there any, any questions? It can be about trends or specific work and project. This is kind of a broad question, but I mean, the I mean, okay, within the borders of what the profession is and how uh, architect's profession, how architects practice in, in, in the, I guess, the United States. Um, how, how far away are these tools or what, what, how are these tools kind of maybe um, going to, say, like, replace, I mean, is there like, like any way that this, these kind of tools can replace like what, what we do now? Um, as architects, or are we like really far away from that? Or do you see me like? Uh, I'm happy to take that one. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, I, short answer, no. I don't think it's replacing us anytime soon. And, and I firmly believe I think it will never replace us, um, as an architect, I speak. <laughs> um, but I, I do think, as of where the industry is, in, in what I see, I'd say that we're at the tipping point for around generative design. That's a point that, that is getting really comfortable for where we are, uh, at least what I'm seeing in, in everything that we do. The, you know, from there, there are many methods before you get to sort of machine learning and artificial intelligence, but generally that is where we are, which is, in sort of how I understand it, is optional. Right? It's, it's, it's creating millions of options and giving you 10 best options. So 
that's what we will do if we're not doing that already. Can I add my favorite example to that? So before the spreadsheet was a spreadsheet, you had people that did spreadsheets on paper. And if you had a business and you, you would go to your accountant and say, like, hey, what happens if, if the interest rate rises by 1%? And he would go to his big paper spreadsheet and fill in all the numbers and calculate it through with them. And call it <coughs> and like, hey, um, I, I, I know I the answer for you. And then you go, like, oh, but what happens if it's 1.5%? He goes back to his room and he does the same thing again. And um, you don't get very much knowledge out of that. And then, then computers had spreadsheets. That did not kill the financial industry at all. Instead, it, it, it led to this huge opportunity to, because you can explore these spaces, whether they're financial or architectural, much better if you have the right tools. Hi, okay. we'll, we'll go to your question in one second, but I just wanna, um, I want to say that I agree with that vision. That's, that's what we should advocate for, but I think we have to advocate for it. And in other words, the, the flip side of that question is, um, if 90% of buildings are already built without hiring an architect, you know, so we're already in a problem space, um, are, is it going to be now 95%? Because there are these forces, there's these forces that we don't, we never talk about this. <laughs> but if there are those forces already, like they're there for a reason because people, you know, making buildings is expensive. A lot of people making buildings want to have a return on investment quickly. It's a profit, profit driven industry. That's all industries, but the stakes are super high. So little by little, as we talk about like the most high end examples of, you know, AI and discovering something new. And, I'm, I'm criticizing myself here too, by the way. But you know, are we just missing the, slowly the forces that already have the 90% of the buildings are going to raise it to 97%, and we're just the frogs in the slowly heating water, right? And all of a sudden, it's 99.9. The school's closed. <laughs> Go home, our fields. I have to think it's the opposite. I think it's the moving towards the 85%. I mean, if you're not going to spend. Hopefully, we're not going to spend our time moving toilets around for ages. Right? So I think that, for example, when we set a project now, and, and obviously we're not counting these themes when we're setting it, but we are always setting the idea of shorter, cheaper, faster. We get you to into your building as fast as you can. So we take less money because it'll cost you less money. So I think that 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 will allow us to work on more stuff. It'll allow us to reach. 15% of the buildings are the 10%. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree. I just, <laughs> but, but I think you're advocating for that. I mean, that, that was the thing that, that the first round of answers. Like, you have to advocate for that. You have to, your business model might be, we can use these tools to do it faster, so we don't have to charge you as much, and therefore, some of the 90% will hire an architect, because before, it was just too expensive. We still make the case for why we need to exist. Yes, we have to make that. Every single time we, we uh, you know, propose. <laughs> but I, I would also think that if you can actually bring in these objective functions and these learners that actually tell you that, what, that allow you to prove that what you're doing is better than the, the baseline, it's not just about making things cheaper and faster. If you can prove that you have a higher added value, then it's hard to say no. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah totally. Well, and, and you can. Um, like you said in your slides, um, show the client this trade-off, this data-driven trade-off between the things that are important. So I think it will require, again, like a little bit of active, you know, um, advocating for the value of it and saying, like, look, this is, you're getting so much more for this. Uh, I don't know, but <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I think one of the places where we have struggled with in the past, and, and we're trying to change that, bit, especially around this data-driven environment is to try and extend our effect on a building after it's built. So we talk about asset management as being something entirely different, but when you can draw data throughout the life of the building, when we say that it can you know, do this kind of level of sustainable design, and then when you can spend 15 years proving that it does, I think that there is value there that's driven by this, and, and that helps us make the case more when, when we're setting these buildings. Yeah, which, by the way, both of these comments might suggest that maybe we need to be teaching trade-offs. Maybe we need to be 
um, teaching postdocs and that kind of stuff as well. Uh, well, I believe that the ingenuity of an architect is his ability to overview a very complex problem with a very large around the space. And sometimes the empirical knowledge of doing that is more important than generating more options. Do you see any way of using machine learning to encode this empirical knowledge of the design decision uh, process in, in, in your machine learning tools? Um, so two thoughts. One is uh, in the ideal case, you, you hope that your, your, your algorithm can learn from you know, existing buildings and, and, and figure, figure that out. The other thing that uh, I've been starting to look at is uh, bringing reinforcement learning, where you, know, you actually try to have, have a model that actually learns what the modifications that you make which ones are good and which ones are bad. And, and it's not just this point in space, but it's like this actual journey from a you know from my building and, and the cutouts and the, the, the reshaping and the orientation. So I think there's yeah. Yeah and I think there are also possibilities for um, like in the stroke analysis that I briefly touched on at the end of my presentation. So we can do some analysis in which you know uh, ten different people are drawing silhouette strokes and we can recognize that. But we can also look at your strokes in particular and learn a lot about what you're trying to express semantically. So I think there are possibilities of that. Ideally, uh, these systems are actually assisting you uh, in your own design process, in your own methods, your own style, um, rather than just kind of importing other examples that have been done previously. I think this prompts a question for myself, which is, it seems broadly speaking, there's really two things here. There's one where AI is kind of automation and it's like the existential crisis of architects where we're going to replace certain tasks with you know, scripts and maybe intelligent agents. And the other, which you both just touched on, is this idea of automated design. You know, new design tools that don't necessarily solve the problem, but they open up a whole way of design we never thought of before, right? Like drawing 3D from a screen is kind of like an amazing experience that I didn't realize I could do. Um, and so I wonder, maybe at Jacobs, in terms of all the things you're investing in, what percentage is automation, what percentage is augmentation? And, and I don't really know which way the industry is printing. I know which way I personally would love to see it go, um, but my fear is that it's not going towards augmentation, it's going towards automation. Uh, you would be exactly right. <laughs> right. Um, uh, but I think that's because it's the easiest, so people don't have to it. It's there. Right. You can see it, you can, you can comprehend it. And I agree with you, I think that there is a whole lot of sort of conversation on sort of augmented design that we haven't gotten there yet, which is why we're, we're starting with that. Um, thank you so much for all the answers. It was very interesting. Uh, yesterday at Columbia, there was a conversation uh, directed by a neuroscientist who specializes in AI. Uh, called um, It was uh, called Human Rights for the Future, discussing the ethics of neurotech and AI. So this person spoke about the emergence of brain-to-computer interfaces. Um, <coughs> you know, and so artificial intelligence is very much inspired by neurology. So with the emergence of this knowledge uh, comes the issue of um, a number of ethical issues with the brain to computer interface and the access to uh, augmentation, but also you know, the feedback of that, which is the access to thoughts. Uh, so a sort of expansion of privacy issues that we're facing at the moment. Um, and then the idea of uh, neural rights, so in terms of identity and free will, sort of uh, with the emergence of AI and the mapping of the brain, an understanding that um, you know of free will is determined by that as we don't necessarily have free will as individual, but maybe we have free will as a species. Uh, and um, and anyway, so they, they talk about sort of uh, also you know equal access to the augmentation of AI and to digital tools, etc. So there's a sort of uh, emergence of human rights issues around AI. And so in relation to that, around AI and neurology, um, I'm interested in talking about architecture as a practice that's very much rooted in um, a territory that's at peace, right? So architecture only emerges when there's no war. Uh, and then the territory and the society is stable enough for, that, for us to be constructing buildings, right? It, it, it pre-requires 
a stability that we can't take for granted. Um, but so if we sort of zoom out of that and then consider the fact that architect architecture happens without architects, and we try to understand our positioning as people who can go back and forth between the humanities and the sciences, right? We have this sort of cognitive ability that's a bit unique and that is not necessarily encouraged by the structure of academia. So um, in relation to that, I'm interested in, in looking at architecture as this practice that's rooted in the sort of, uh, you know, in this idea of like peaceful territory and that looks to preserve that peace by having interventions that are future oriented and sort of foresee the possibility for conflict. So in that case, it's like the conflicts that AI and neuroscience or the brain to computer, the risks of the brain to computer interface can, can bring forward. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if that's, um, if that's something you're interested in like commenting on or if you see a sort of agency that our field has with the emergence of these human rights issues in relation to, to AI that, um, that, that we're suited to tackle that maybe not, you know, that, because there are extremely complex issues that definitely require a lot of um, a specific knowledge. And I'm not sure that people trained in human rights or people trained in neurology are necessarily, you know, best fit to approach these problems that require a sort of access to all of these disciplines. And as architects, we have always been orchestrating these various knowledge together, like working with engineers, working with politicians, working with financiers, working with the people impacted by, and sort of synthesizing all of these voices through our interventions. So I wonder if, if you would like to, um, to talk about that or, or uh, in, in, in relation to education or in relation to you know, how we position ourselves professionally with regards to these massive transformations that are happening. Like white <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we've passed this consensus through this, and I think you can show that a little bit. So, uh, I'm not, uh, in theory, I think that we have to be able to expand who we build the consensus with in general, um, so drawing from all of these fields. And I think that there's a slight bit of consensus around the idea of, of peace building, and, and I will actually push back against architecture's peace, and I'll use a really practical example. One of the things we're doing um, with well, not necessarily AI, but certainly around the idea of anti construction, is we're working with the Army Corps of Engineers to try to see that can you use machines to go in and build in war drawn zones so you don't have to send your people in the in, in harm's way, but you're able to build structures that are needed in that space. Uh, I don't know if that's really way of thinking, but just the idea of, of what technology and architecture can do, I think that has, has wider uh, implications to, to those aspects. Um, I think we're just about running out of time, but if there's one more question, I think we could take that. Um, okay, this is a half mark, but um, kind of touching on what you were saying about machine learning being a such a prediction of like higher models. Um, I'm curious if you all think of uh, machine learning either without data, where uh, data doesn't come first, but it comes at the end, or the model comes first, the assumptions come first, not the data. If there's any thoughts on kind of contortions with that or AI and ML models that I guess maybe are not predictive or, or predictive but don't contingent on a set of a large set of prior assumptions and predictions, sorry, a large set of prior observations made about the world condensed into a form of data that are then used to construct a model. I'm um, just zooming out for a second, it feels like that it's, it's the predominant form of how models are structured, um, which then has a lot of repercussions as to like, you know, the whole like, you know, bias baked into the model, baked into the data, baked into it, et cetera. But also the um, economics of scale involved in gathering this kind of data, you know, and um, thus like what kind of actors can use what kind of data, what kind of actors can collect kind of such kind of data, and also what data that don't exist in the first place, you know, so, um, so I'm curious if there are any thoughts on, are there alternatives to a data first model in your practice? <coughs> what would that be? And how would that, yeah, how would that 
So we do a lot of data collection in our work, and um, often my students will like kind of have an answer in mind, like or a model in mind. But actually, I try to encourage them to be uh, very open in looking at it that we don't know yet. Like we start collecting a lot of data, maybe starting with some question. Uh, but then I think models really can be built on what you learn from that data. Um, and it is, you know, sort of an art and science, I think, to asking the right questions about that data, like to, to get the right insights. Um, but you need to build <coughs> the model first. Um, I think you can actually start collecting information and with an open mind, you know, sort of look at things as they emerge um, and then sort of drive a model from that. And I guess I was thinking about the cost of doing it inversely, which I feel like is never happened. Very well, uh, Deep Blue, the name was based on Deep Thought from this Earth Galaxy. Galaxy. Yeah. And that computer, they switched on without connecting to any data. Right. You know, right. Got to income tax before somebody managed to switch it off. So. <laughs> and then, you know, I'm not an expert in this, obviously, by any means, but I think that the assumptions are always based on data, whether that means as historical or education, you know, when we make assumptions on how modern needs to be built, we are building off some sort of history. So while I understand what you're asking, I don't think that that, I think the, most, the assumptions and the data are, are laid in a way that are, it's, it's just um, tangled to the worst. I think the other, other question where you look at what, you know, some data is just much easier to get, and how much does that drive the development of this, uh, A certain competition doesn't require data. Sure. Like, a, like a hammer doesn't generate data. It doesn't operate in any competition. It's not the same case. You know, like, are there ways of thinking about artificial intelligence that is data less than total competition? Um, maybe just to uh, have one quick kind of final question as, as our wrap up. I'm wondering if any of you have thoughts about. Um, practice or industry versus academia you know um, what kind of things in, you know all of this discussion should be happening in practice what kind of things should be happening in academia what should the roles be another way of framing that would be who's leading in the context of ai and architecture who's leading at the moment um, but i think maybe more broadly is you know what are what are the models we should be I'd say the industry is leading, but not the architecture industry. I think that that's, that's where, we're, where we are at right now. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, and also, just with computation more generally, often architects are sort of um, adopting tools often that are generated in completely different industries. But um, ideally, I think architects should be driving that. I think often in schools of architecture, it's, you know, often practice driven with both. But I think there's a real need for sort of long-term thinking about <coughs> these questions. Yeah, so great. <laughs> well, that, that's a perfect way to end, right? That's a challenge to all of us here in this room. So thank you very much.